Hi, my name is Matt, and I'll be presenting our team's submission on group-based ensembles and strategic pre-processing for the ASHRAE Great Energy Predictor 3 competition. The learning objectives for this presentation are to understand the goals of the competition, to help reproduce the models that we created, to understand how these models can be used to, in various applications, to learn new types of data science and machine learning techniques as applied to building performance analysis. So first, my teammate and I would like to thank Clayton Miller and the organizers of the competition. We'd like to give a special special thank you to Panda Rasmi Arjunan, who worked to reproduce our submission. And finally, we'd like to thank the Kaggle team for hosting this competition on their platform. This is a high-level overview of what I'll be talking about today, and so I'll dive right into it. First, some background on our team. My teammate, Isamu, is a software engineer at Canon. He has a lot of experience in image and signal processing, simulation, and machine learning. My name is Matt, and I'm a data scientist at H2O. I previously worked as a data science consultant for a company called Shifted Energy, and I help them predict energy usage for water heaters. And I feel like that prior experience helped me in this competition. Um, so the task of this competition was to predict future building energy usage from historical data, and the metric was root mean squared log error. We were also given additional data such as building metadata like square footage of the building the, and the year that it was created. And we were also provided a useful weather data set containing alter temperature measurements and things like wind speed and wind direction. Um, this figure gives you an idea of what we were given and what we had to predict. In orange is one year's worth of historical data. The green shows predictions for the next two years. And the blue curve are ground truth labels from data that was publicly available online. So our first step was to pre-process the data. And there are multiple forms of pre-processing that we applied. And I'll discuss them in more detail now. First, we aligned the time zones of the data. The data that we had came from different locations or sites, and the weather data had timestamps that were not in local time, and so that made it difficult to model time of day patterns. Um, some other competitors determined and shared the time zones of, for the different locations, and from this information, they were able to align the timestamps of the weather data with the building energy usage data. Next was temperature imputation. Um, temperature was an important input to our model, but part of the temperature data was missing. Um, and so we found that linear interpolation was a simple yet effective way of filling in the missing temperature data. After that, we re removed anomalies from the training data. We considered any data that didn't fall into a predictable pattern to be an anomaly. In particular, there were two main types of anomalies. The first is long streaks of constant values. For example, in the bottom left-hand corner of the plot, you can see a long streak of zero energy usage. and there could be a good reason for the zeros, but we assume that whatever the reason is, it's unlikely that this pattern will continue into the future, and so we removed this portion of the data from the data set. The other type of anomaly were large spikes in the data. Here you can see a few large spikes in the data um, circled in the middle of the plot. These spikes are really hard to predict, and if we left them in our data set, then our model would focus too much on trying to predict the spikes. Here's a plot that 
shows what happens when we keep the anomalies in. The green curve is a raw training data from 2016, and the dark blue curve is a model's predictions when we keep the anomalies in. You can see that in July 2017 that the predictions get a bit more volatile, and this corresponds to the anomalies in July of the previous year. Um, the sine curve is a model's predictions when we remove the anomalies from the training data. And here the predictions look a lot less volatile. And the model is focusing on predicting the main patterns in the data. Our last form of pre-processing was target variable transformations. Um, most competitors log transform the target variable. Um, this made the target variable closer to a normal distribution, and it's important for models like linear regression and MLPs to be well posed. The other type of target transformation that we applied was to divide the meter reading by square feet. So instead of predicting energy usage, we were predicting energy usage per square foot, and this put the target variable on the same scale no matter the size of the building. So now that we've talked about how we cleaned up our data, we'll now discuss our feature engineering methods. The first features that I'll talk about have to do with the temperature. Um, smoothing temperature is a way to reduce some of the noise in the data, and that's what's shown in the top plot. In the bottom plot, there are the first and second order difference, differences of temperature. These features can make non-stationary data stationary, and they add rate of change information to the model. Here are some of the other features that we used. Um, the first is categorical interactions. So to construct these features, you take two features and convert them into strings. Then you concatenate them together with a separator, such as an underscore or a dash. Um, for example, we could create a weekday and hour interaction, which treats hour on different days as separate categories. So we're explicitly telling the model that this is a useful way to look at the data, rather than letting the model figure this relationship out by itself. Um, cyclic encoding of periodic features is a way to make distances between periodic features consistent. For example, if we treat weekday as ordinal, where Monday is 1, Tuesday is 2, all the way up to Sunday, which is 7, then the distance between Monday and Tuesday is 1, but the distance between Sunday and Monday is 6. Um, and so to fix this, we map the ordinal points to points on the unit circle using these formulas. And now if we calculate the distances, the distance between Monday and Tuesday will be the same as the distance between Sunday and Monday. Um, Bayesian target encoding. Well, target encoding can be thought of as a very simple model. It takes a categorical variable and it calculates the mean of the target variable in that category. And that becomes a prediction for that category. Um, Bayesian target encoding takes this a step further and uses a prior distribution for the mean of the target variable. After that, we use Bayes' rule to get a posterior distribution for the mean. Then we reduce the distribution, the posterior distribution, down into a point estimate using the mean of the posterior. Um, Bayesian target encoding allows us to take advantage of hierarchy, hierarchies in the data. For example, the data can be partitioned by site, then each site can be partitioned by the buildings at that site, and then we can further partition again using the meter that was used to record the energy usage. And at each level of the hierarchy, we, have a, we can have a prior and a posterior. For example, we can use the posterior of the site mean as a prior to the building mean, then the posterior of the building mean can be the prior for the meter mean. Um, lastly, holi holiday indicator variables were an important feature for us. 
um, energy usage changes noticeably on some holidays. And so um, because we only have one year's worth of training data, we need to manually include these features. If we didn't, then it would be much harder for a model to reliably learn how to deal with holidays on its own. So this is not a, a complete list of features that we used. These are just the ones that were not very common or the ones that we found important for our models. Now I'll briefly um, talk about the models that we used. Um, the models that we used in this competition were similar to what other competitors used. In particular, we used like GBM and CatBoost for gradient boosted decision trees. And we used multi-layer perceptrons and tried other types of neural network architectures like recurrent neural networks and 1D convolutional neural networks. Um, the multi-layer perceptrons made it into our final model, um, but we weren't able to get recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural, neural networks to work well. And that's not to say that they couldn't work well, it's just that we weren't able to get good models from them. Um, now I'll discuss how we validated our models. We actually used multiple approaches to validating the data, but I'm going to focus on just this one here because this was the only approach that we didn't see a lot of other teams using. The approaches that we used are, the other approaches that we used are pretty common. So we split the data using the first two months as a validation set and the remaining data as a training set. Then we take the next two months as a validation set and the remaining data as a training set and, and so forth. Um, I'll mention here that the number of months in the validation set is a hyperparameter. It didn't have to be two. Instead, we could have used one month or three or more months for the validation set size. Uh, so I mentioned that this is not the only validation method that we used. We also used grouped k-fold cross-validation where you don't use consecutive months. And we also use standard k-fold cross-validation where the validation set is a random subset of rows. Um, there were a lot of modeling decisions that we needed to make during the competition. For example, we could have trained a model on the entire data set, or we could train a model for each meter. Um, so we could have also split up the data in different ways and trained a model for each um, split of the data. Um, after that, we needed to choose which model to, to use. And we also had to determine the validation scheme there were a number of other hyperparameters that also needed to be set. <clears throat> so we tried a lot of different combinations of modeling decisions. In the end, we didn't choose just one set of decisions. Every time we trained a new model, we saved the predictions. And then for our final model, we ensembled these predictions together using a weighted average. <clears throat> we used the leak data to tune the weights and ensembling help decrease the error by 0 0.03, which is a lot in this competition. Um, so admittedly, our solution is not the most elegant. We estimate that we worked over 200 hours on this competition, and we used a lot of models and a lot of compute for the final submission. Um, running our submission takes roughly two hour, or two weeks of compute. Uh, I worked on models using a workstation which has 256 gigabytes of RAM, a 40 core CPU, and two 1080 Ti GPUs. The summary used the Kaggle kernels which has a respectable 16 gigs of RAM, a 4 core CPU, and a P100 GPU. Even though our final submission was an ensemble of models, it's still useful to know what our best single model is. Our best, 
Our best single model was Light GBM, and its score is 1.272 on the private leaderboard. And this would have gotten us around 200th place. So ensembling was really important for us. Um, the important features that were part of our model were the smoothed and differenced temperature features, Bayesian target encoding, and categorical interactions. We split the data by meter and trained one model per meter and used 12-fold cross-validation using a two-month, um, two months for the validation set. So to summarize, our final model heavily relied on pre-processing the data. There were four different types of pre-processing that we used, and our final model was an ensemble of multiple models. The ensemble brought down the error by 0.03 and was essential to scoring well in this competition. If you'd like to contact us, this is our information. Um, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And thanks for listening to the presentation.